1 John chapter 1 in our Bibles, please. 1 John, the first chapter. And I would like to echo what Brother Monte said. Uh, I'm, I'm excited as well about uh, reinstituting uh, master's clubs. And uh, we talked about that several months ago. I don't remember how long now. But uh, basically, you know, I left that decision up to him because uh, uh, that uh, I'll be, you know, pretty much out of the picture as far as pastoring goes, and uh, it wouldn't be right for me to, uh, you know, try to set the course for that. That would certainly be uh, his uh, his job and his prerogative, and I am 100 percent behind that, and uh, thank the Lord for that. And uh, I'm excited about it as well. And uh, what he mentioned about the, the Pine Card Derby. And uh, we, we've done that for years. I think we've not done it in the last two or three years or whatever. But, uh, you know, that, that's been a big thing. And if any of you fellas need uh, hands-on or uh, not hands-on, I, I guess uh, some, exper- some advice, counsel, help, whatever you'd like to call that from experience about how to, uh, you know, you, uh, if you want a fast car, you need to make it as heavy as you can and still be in the, the legal limit there. And one way that uh, that's done is you drill a hole in the car and then you fill it full of uh, melted lead. And uh, that always works pretty good. So uh, if you would like some help in how to drill a hole in your car, in your wooden block there, while holding it in your hand. Uh, I'll be glad to help you with that. Uh, I will not give a demonstration of that. I can just uh, tell you how it's done. I've still got the scar and uh, my ring is still bent. They had to cut my ring off my finger And uh, if I remember right, I had to have a cast on my arm up to my elbow because of that. And uh, you talk about, you ever ever wonder, you look back on your life and you ever wonder uh, or have a question like this, how in the world could I be so stupid? (laughs) And uh, boy, I was that day. And, uh, but again, I'll be glad to help you with that much as I can. If you want to try it, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you want to, then uh, I can guide you on it. Uh, Seriously, pray for uh, this work of Master Clubs and uh, the potential uh, to reach children and make an impact in their lives is great. And uh, I'm thankful for uh, that direction there. Let's bow for prayer again and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the truth that it reveals to us. Lord, I'm reminded that Jesus said, Thy word is truth. And so we pray that we would receive uh, your word as that, and may it uh, produce fruit in our lives. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to yield ourselves to it. May we allow the Holy Spirit of God to use this word to change us uh, into the image of Christ. Lord, may this work of sanctification uh, be a reality in our lives and uh, may Christ Jesus be glorified and magnified in us. Bless us now, help us. We need you and uh, guide us as we uh, look into the scriptures tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, We'll read a verse or two here in a minute, but uh, I want to go back, and uh, we started this, uh, you know, not necessarily a study in 1 John, uh, but uh, just a few things uh, about this matter of fellowship, Uh, and it started really from the verse that uh, we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, where uh, that verse tells us that God has called us unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so that is part of God's plan and purpose for our lives. If we're saved, then one of the results of being saved 
is that uh, we have this fellowship with Christ. And so John speaks about that. And uh, we'll uh, look at that here in just a few moments and share a few things with you. But uh, the last time I mentioned that one of the reasons John wrote this was to uh, refute the doctrine, the error, the heresy of the Gnostics. And uh, that, that word Gnosticism is, just simply refers to knowledge. And there were people in that day that uh, they stressed knowledge. And of course, John, we'll see how many times he uses that word here in just a few minutes. And John's not against knowledge. God is not against knowledge. But uh, it, 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 there's a world of difference in knowing the right thing and knowing the wrong thing. And uh, even more important than that is knowing the right person. And John stresses that. But I was reading again, and uh, I came across this after uh, the last message that uh, I preached about this, about the Gnostics and their denial of the incarnation of Christ. And of course you remember that what, uh, what they believed is that all material things, all physical things uh, would be evil. And so what would that mean about the body, the literal incarnation of Christ? They denied that. They denied that God manifested Himself in the flesh. And in their minds, God could not have permitted uh, His absolute goodness to be defiled by real involvement in the evil material world, and in particular, in bodily flesh. They denied that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And they taught that Jesus uh, only seemed to be man. That was the perception that people had of Him, and that was a wrong perception. Uh, God did not come in the flesh. Uh, he did not have a truly human body, according to them. And He was really spirit, and only spirit. And the word uh, that some of them used would be that He was phantom. He was just like a ghost. Uh, wasn't anything real about his physical existence at all. And I thought this was interesting. Uh, they, one of their sayings in refuting the uh, physical existence of Christ, Christ existing in a body, was this. It, it, they said that when Jesus walked, he never left any footprints on the ground, denying the physical aspect of his existence. Well, John deals with that. And one of the main things in 1 John is the truth that God has manifested Himself in flesh. He has manifested Himself. He's done so in the person of His Son. Literal flesh and body. The Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Now notice, He also Himself likewise took part of the same. And here's why. That through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You see, that, that's one of the uh, resulting problems of that doctrine of Gnosticism, denying the incarnation of Christ. And we went through several things last time that that would include, and of course one of them would be include his death. If he, if he was not in human flesh, then he couldn't die. And he didn't die. And so uh, we would have no salvation as the Bible declares salvation. Uh, and then Hebrews chapter 2 is not the only passage that uh, confirms that to us. Back in John chapter 19, the crucifixion, 
uh, in verse 32, it says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, talking about those thieves that were crucified with Christ, and of the other which were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw, he, he that saw it by record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And so the Lord Jesus Christ had flesh, he had blood, he had bone, he was 100% uh, man. And yet, the miracle is that he was all, he, he, he became man, but he never ceased to be God. God in the flesh. And not only does John declare that God has manifested himself in 1 John, he also declares that God can be known and is known. Chapter 2 in 1 John and verse 3, it says, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. See, the Gnostics, they were so proud, so uh, they elevated themselves above everybody. A, a believer like you and I, uh, at that time, the Gnostics would look down on them as inferior. Uh, they, would, uh, they would consider them unlearned. Simply because if you believed that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, that God had manifested himself uh, in flesh, then uh, that was proof positive that uh, you were not enlightened as they are. And there's still people that think that way today. Uh, but uh, John emphasizes here that God has manifested himself and that God can be known. Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Now, what is this God, this God who has revealed Himself, this God who can be known? What is He like? What is it to know God? What's it like to know Him and to fellowship? with him. Well, in verse 5 of chapter 1, notice what he says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now that is an important truth. That means a lot. And it would seem to me that in the day in which we live, not, not only just in the day in which John lived when they dealt with the Gnostics, but uh, today there's a lot of talk about God. There's a lot of talk about knowing Him and everything. But what God are they talking about? And I fear that very often it's not the God that has revealed Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Because according to 1 John 1, 5, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Now remember that one of the results of knowing Him uh, or being saved is what we would normally call that. One of the results of that is fellowship. What a great blessing it is that God has designed that when we get saved, we have that privilege of fellowship with Him. 1 John 1 and verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now verses 1 and 2, we looked at this uh, a couple of weeks ago, but let me just point it out again. Verses 1 and 2 make it clear that this is referring to a person. It's not just a thought, not just a theory. 
uh, but a person. John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That's a life. That's a person he's talking about. In John 1 and verse 4, or verse 1 through 4, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In verse 14, this is the verse Jacob was talking about earlier. Uh, it says this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there is no doubt, no debate whatsoever that what John is talking about in uh, 1 John chapter 1 is a person. It is Christ, the God-man. Uh, God manifesting Himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again in 1 John 1 and verse 3, he emphasizes this, Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so this is the thing I want us to think about and, and, and meditate on. Fellowship. We're saying, according to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9, God has called us unto fellowship with His Son. Well, what does that mean? What, what, the, what, what kind of impact should that have in our lives? Well, uh, remember the, the thought, the meaning, the idea behind this word fellowship. It means to have in common. But it's more than that. It, it includes a commonality between people. But in the sense that John is using it here in referring to fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, it, uh, it, it, it includes the idea to share a mutual life. Now whose life is it that's shared? Did God need life from us? No, we needed life from Him. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We had no spiritual life. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, God, when He saved us, gave us the life that existed in Himself. And so that, that is the God, that is the life that John says we have fellowship with. We have fellowship with the Father. We have fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, if again, going back to the question, well, what, what, what does that mean for us? What's this God like? That we're supposed to have fellowship with, that we have something in common with, that we share that life, not just with, but from. We, we receive our spiritual life from Him, and it's only because of Him that we have that life. And so if we have fellowship with that, with, with Him, what does it mean? Well, if God is light, and if God is perfect in righteousness, and that's what it means when He says there, in Him is no darkness at all. Don't overlook those Two little words, at all. In Him is no darkness at all. Then fellowship with Him means that we share in and partake of His righteousness. And that's true in two ways. Uh, we'll only have time tonight to focus on one of these, but... Uh, uh, I'll mention the last one uh, at the close. But it's true positionally 
And then it's true practically. This fellowship that we have with this God who is light and who is perfect in righteousness. Uh, we have something in common with Him. Uh, we have life from Him that He gives to us. So let's think about what, uh, what that means for us positionally. I've, I use, I, well, I've referred to that word a lot. There, there are positional truths in the Bible. Basically what that's referring to is that these are things that God has done for us and they will not change. It, it, it uh, uh, connects us with our uh, union, our, uh, our being uh, in Christ. Now, listen to 2 Peter chapter 1. You're familiar with uh, all of these verses probably that we're going to look at tonight. But 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with, with us, now notice this, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace be and peace be multiplied unto you. And then listen to what he says here, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That's the same thing John is talking about. Knowing God. Uh, having His life. Verse 3 says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now that's what God has done for us. That describes our position in Christ. And uh, notice especially, or pay attention especially, to uh, what Peter mentions in verse 2, through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that word knowledge, uh, John uses, it's one of his favorite words or a form of it, uh, the words know or known. Those two words, know or known, uh, are found at least 32 times in this little book of 1 John. And by the way, uh, I remember when I first got saved that I read, somebody told me that uh, uh, one of the first things I ought to do is read 1 John, and that is true. Uh, every new believer should read 1 John over and over and over again, and it wouldn't hurt for those of us that have been saved for many years to read it and reread it and reread it as well. So, know or known, uh, one of John's favorite words. Eleven times out of those 32 times, John uses that word in uh, reference to knowing God. And that's what he's emphasizing. And uh, in, in some verses, he uses it as a positive thing. In some verses, he uses it as a negative thing. And what I mean by that is that sometimes John uses it, he's talking about our knowing God. Other times he uses it, he's uh, talking about others not knowing God. Now let me just give you a few of those. Turn, turn with these, uh, 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 to these with me. First John chapter 2, look at verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Look at verse 13. I write unto you fathers because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye've overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because ye have known the father. I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. 
I've written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, and here's one of the negative things, because it knew him not. Boy, there's a great contrast in, in what John reveals here in 1 John about knowing God and those that don't know Him. You know what? That ought to be evident in our lives. That, that, that ought to be clear in our lives that we know Him. Uh, look at chapter 3 and verse 6. Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Him, neither known Him. There's another statement about those that don't know Him. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is uh, not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7 in chapter 4, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. Chapter 5 and verse 20, and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now we're talking about uh, this matter of knowing God and uh, what He's done for us positionally. God has uh, historically, for lack of a better word, done these things. This, these things are a matter of record in the Word of God. We have these things. Uh, we don't have to wonder about them. God has declared that He's done these things. Now, what are those things? We don't have time tonight to list everything, but just a few things here that really relate to what I'm trying to get across here in 1 John about this matter of fellowship with Him who is light and in whom is no darkness at all. Uh, what that means for us really flows from the reality of our knowing Him who is light and in whom is no darkness at all. Well, what are some of these things positionally that God has done for us? Well, one, He's delivered us from darkness to light. I think Brother Monteith mentioned that this morning. Or, matter of fact, there were a couple of times this morning I got a little worried uh, because I thought He was going to go down the same, and, and you know, almost did. But uh, that's okay. I, I love it when things sort of mesh together like that. Sunday school teachers have mentioned to me before about. Uh, their Sunday school lessons that day and then what was preached just sort of dovetails together. And so really that, that's uh, the case here tonight and what Brother Monteith preached this morning too. He has delivered us from darkness to light. Now remember Paul's testimony in Acts chapter 26. Uh, he's describing not only what God did for him on the Damascus road in saving him, but the work that God had for him to do. And in verse 18 of Acts 26, he says this, talking about his work to the Gentiles. Here's what God called him to do. To open their eyes, in verse 18, and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Now, that's what God does when a person gets saved. Uh, they're, they're, he delivers us from darkness and delivers us to light, delivers us from the power of Satan unto God. In uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, it says this, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Or, or uh, Colossians 1 and verse 13, I'm sorry. Who hath delivered us from the power 
of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And here's one of the things about knowing God and fellowshipping with Him with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, who is described in verse 5 of 1 John 1 as light and in whom is no darkness at all, that should make an impact in our lives after we get saved. The fact that our position is in Christ who is light, that, that, that determines the way we live. And there is something drastically wrong with someone's testimony who claims to know Him who is light, who claims to be in fellowship with Him who is light and in whom is no darkness at all, and then that life be characterized by a walk of darkness. The Bible uh, repudiates that. Jesus said this in John 8 and verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, Well, let me me just go on and say some of these things later as far as application to these things go. Again, let me echo what I just said. If we are children of light, And if we know Him who is light, and we are in fellowship with Him in whom there is no darkness, does it not just make sense that our lives should be characterized by His light and not this world's darkness? Uh, He has delivered us from this world of darkness. Something else, and and Brother Monteith referred to this as well this morning. He has imputed His righteousness to us. I love that truth. God has imputed to me His very righteousness. That blows my mind. Uh, Listen to Romans 3 and verse 24 through 26 being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus." And then in chapter 4 of Romans, he goes on and he gives illustration of that truth. In verse 1 he says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Remember that word, counted. In verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Uh, Keep that word in mind, reckoned. Verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted. There's that word again, for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. All three of those words, counted, reckoned, and imputeth, are translated from the same Greek word. And they all mean the same thing. Uh, it's the idea uh, to take inventory, it, it's an accounting term. Uh, to take inventory and to place or credit to another's account. And here's what happened when you got saved. God, uh, well, 
He took inventory of our lives when he pronounced us all guilty. He, he knew we're all guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.19 says that uh, God has declared that all the world is guilty before him. So when God took inventory of your life and mine, he found us lacking. We were bankrupt when it came to spiritual life. Uh, we were sinners by nature. And you know what he did? He imputed to you and me the very righteousness of his son. He put that on your account. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's hard to fathom, isn't it? You, if you're saved before God, you positionally, and don't forget, we're talking about our position in Christ. We've not got to the practical side yet. Positionally, you are just as righteous before God as His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean you're anything special as far as being better than anybody else. That's a testimony to the grace of God. You deserve judgment, and I deserve judgment in hell for all eternity, and because of His grace, God has imputed to us, He has placed to our account the righteousness of His Son. And along with that, He's made us partakers of His divine nature. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's interesting, and I didn't know this before I was studying this. The word partakers there comes from the same root word that we find in 1 John chapter 1 uh, in verse 3 where he's talking about fellowship. Same idea. Partakers of the divine nature, same root word for fellowship. Fel knowing God and fellowship with Him Boy, that means something. It'll all be evident in our lives. I remember the thought behind fellowship. Uh, it means to have something in common. Uh, to share a mutual life. Don't forget as well what, what, what God is like. The Bible says God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. And if we share in His life, if we have been made partakers of His divine nature, is there any testimony, is there any evidence in our lives, in our daily living, that such is true? There should be. Our, our walk, our, our conduct, our behavior, our attitudes... All of our being, our entire lives should be a testimony that not only we know this God who is light and in whom is no darkness, but we are in fellowship with Him. And then another thing that He's done for us positionally, He's given us eternal life. 1 John 5 and verse 11 says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So, uh, eternal life, you know this. This is, this is really fundamental and elementary, but at the same time, it is profound truth. Our life is in Christ. And so in saving us, God has done a wonderful, He's done a powerful work of grace in us and for us so that we are delivered from the power of Satan and darkness. He's imputed to us the very righteousness of Christ. 
He has made us partakers of His divine nature and He has given us life in His Son, which is eternal life. And what God has done for us positionally, all of these things and more, that has powerful uh, results uh, for us practically. And uh, look, if you would, in chapter 1 and verse 6. And I'll close with this. Uh, our position, and, and we've known this before, our position is to determine our practice. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, with who? With this God who is light and in whom is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, and this is uh, referring to the habit of our life. This is, this is, this is not just uh, someone stumbling in their Christian life and uh, falling into sin. This is talking about uh, this is their life characteristic. This, this identifies and defines their life. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, here's what the Bible says. We lie and do not the truth. You know, it's easy for us to fool ourselves, isn't it? And even to fool others. Uh, how plain and how forceful John is about this. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, fellowship with this one who is light and in whom is no darkness at all, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and then we walk in darkness, if our life is characterized not by His light, but by the darkness of this world, John says, we're lying and we're not living according to God's truth. And so when we read in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, well, verse 3, he says, Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We, we have that commonality with Him. We, we share in that life from Him. And we fellowship with Him. And then verse 5 says that this God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Uh, let's make sure that the desire of our hearts and, and uh, the direction of our lives is consistent uh, with this God who is light. Now, we do stumble and fall. He deals with that in the latter part of this chapter and on into chapter 2 and verse 1 he says my little children these things write I unto you that you sin